Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The text for the 19th Sunday after Pentecost comes from our epistle reading of Hebrews. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside of his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. Thus far the text. Because we have been made to be one with Christ Jesus through this gracious gift of baptism granted to us, we have what he has. This is the statement of fact that we believe. We believe it and teach it and confess it. It is also the statement of fact that we Christians are oftentimes ridiculed for. It is also the statement of fact that we Christians oftentimes have a difficult time fully understanding or even believing. And the reason for this is because almost everything in this world seems to speak against and prove the exact opposite. Most everything we come in contact with leads us to wonder and doubt and question whether or not God is really in control over everything, whether or not he really has all things placed in subjection to him. And if he does, then what does that mean for me? The now, but not yet, of this life is difficult to comprehend and even more difficult to place our trust in because the sinner can't fathom such a thing Because what we experience is the now. We haven't seen the not yet. We haven't woken up one day with the not yet finally come and all of our problems gone and vanished. No, the things that we have to deal with here on this fallen earth of ours are almost always the ones that scream louder than the way in which our God speaks to us through his word. And yes, we can read the Bible and hear the promises of God spoken over us in the divine service, we can grasp onto them in faith and receive them as ours, but then, wouldn't you know it, before we realize it, there we are, doubting ourselves once again. And one could almost say that it's natural for the sinner to doubt and disbelieve. Just keep reading one chapter further from our Old Testament reading in Genesis for today, and you can see how true this is. And we heard about the same exact thing just a couple of weeks ago in a gospel reading where a father of a young demon-oppressed boy comes blathering to Jesus, begging for a miracle, but not really sure whether or not Jesus can do it, confessing that he trusts in Jesus, but at the very same time admitting that he doesn't. Of all of the best lines in the Bible to make my own, I would love to be able to say that in the midst of danger and suffering and trial and impending death, I would be able to speak just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego with that faith-filled speech that they give to Nebuchadnezzar saying, My God has authority over all things, even you, and has the power to save me from all of my enemies. But even if he doesn't, Even if I end up dead, I will worship none other than him. But more often than not, the words that come squeaking out of my mouth are the words of that father from a couple weeks ago. I believe. Help my unbelief. And flip on the news at any point in time over the last couple of years, and you can't help but find a never-ending uncertainty and fear Wars are started and they're ended seemingly without a care in the world for the majority of the innocent people and families who just want to live their life in comfort, who just want to raise up their kids and children in peace. And invisible illnesses fly all over the world in the blink of an eye, stopping life as we know it, overwhelming hospitals and clinics, shutting down businesses and churches. It seems as if this world is just playing a giant game of Jenga, and all of us know that it's just a matter of time until it all comes crashing down. And unfortunately, all of this divides over the country, over congregations, 
no matter what side of the aisle that we find ourselves to be on. It's difficult to understand how all of this chaos is placed under the holy feet of Jesus as he sits at the right hand of the Father. Because it doesn't seem as if any good can actually come out of any of this madness. Or forget about the things that are happening a thousand miles away. Just look at your own life. We all have ample opportunity to question the absolute supremacy of a God who seems so very far away from me in the midst of my suffering and my trials. Ongoing family and personal struggles can cause us to stare up into the heavens and shake a fist and scream, Where are you, God? Don't you see what's happening to me? Don't you even care? You said I'm your child. Well, am I? How can you allow this stuff to continue, to rage on day after day, year after year, decade after decade? Where is your authority over all of this? We say all of this because right now, we don't see everything placed under Jesus' feet. At least not in a way that makes sense to us. It's far, far outside of our understanding And it makes us want to doubt everything. A sinful fallen world will do this to sinful fallen creatures. Even to those who have been baptized. Even to those who believe. Living in this veil of tears makes it easier to doubt than to trust. And so we find ourselves fearing and loving and trusting in anything and everything other than God and his promises for us. For we know about the cross and the glory that the Father has revealed there through the death of His Son, but what does that matter today? What does that mean for me right here in the now, but not yet? How does that speak to any of the sin in my life right now? How does it speak to any of that shame that other people's sin have placed upon me yesterday? Or last week, or last year, the shame that I still carry around deep in the pit of my soul, the shame that makes me sick to my stomach every time I think about it. What does the cross and resurrection and ascension of Jesus say to all of that? And perhaps the most difficult thing that we have to face is that last and final enemy of death whether it's ours or someone that we love, death is a vile, bitter, evil thing that never brings about joy or happiness. Death promises to be so permanent, so completely defeating. With everything else, there can at least be a sliver of hope, we think, a sliver of escape, but not so with death because dirt on a coffin has an unmistakable finality to it, doesn't it? Where is God's supremacy over that? And if he does, in fact, have even death placed under his feet, and if that actually means that I do too, then explain to me why it still hurts as much as it does. The difficulty of all of it is that now but not yet stuff. It's meant to be a comfort for us, and it truly is, in some sense, to that saintly side of us, it is. But to the sinner, it's the waiting that's the hardest part. Because the waiting has a funny little way of making us doubt as to whether or not the not yet will finally come. And the demons do a devilishly good job at getting us to believe that the victory isn't as certain as we had hoped it to be. That's why our epistle reading begins with a reminder of just that. We must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. We are called to pay close attention to these words of God, because sin, death, and the devil are tirelessly working against us. And it's their hope that we drift away from these promises that we hear that we hear the now and not yet as a hope in doubtfulness, not a hope in certainty. 
On this side of heaven, these enemies of ours will never stop plaguing us with doubt and despair. And if left to our own abilities to subdue these demons, if left to our own understanding of these things that are placed out in front of us, we will quickly fall victim to all of them. And then the danger is, as our epistle reading says, that we'll drift away from the sure and complete promises of God. But these promises of God have come to us by a word. And not just any word, not just a normal word, but a word that became flesh and dwelt among us. A word that became flesh and died a fleshy death and was raised from the dead in the flesh, not just the spirit. A word that is at this very instant in the flesh of you and me and seated at the right hand of the Father with all things placed under his fleshy feet. And for us, right now, that means that we have a fleshy word that is here given to us, even right now, even in the now but not yet. We have a great high priest who serves us, even now, even today. And this great high priest, this crucified and resurrected and ascended Jesus is a fleshy one who first did all of those things for us in the flesh. He is a God who has put all the glories of heaven aside so that he could take on our flesh and then, in the humbleness of a servant, die a death, even a death upon a cross. He is a great high priest who did more than any other high priest could ever hope to do as he was the one who offered his own flesh as a sacrifice for us. Him the victim, him the priest, him the lamb that was slain, him the priest, him the one who poured out the blood that cleanses from all sin, and him the priest who offered that sacrificial blood on my behalf and on your behalf and on behalf of the entire world. And all of that should be good enough. Except our God knows us more than we know ourselves. And he knows that we need something more in this valley of the shadow of death. Something more than we could ever understand or ask for by ourselves. In seating Jesus in the flesh, at the right hand of the Father, all things have been placed under his feet. But God knew that as he sat there, and as we sit here, in the certainty of the now but not yet, we will still find our sinful flesh wondering and doubting because of that not yet. And so he gives to us a pledge and a guarantee far and above just a, just trust me. That would be good enough. That should be good enough. But if truth be told, as sin and decay and the demons and death surround me, I have to admit that isn't good enough for me. So today this high priest who sits in the flesh, in your flesh and mine in the heavens, still comes down to us in a word. But again, this is no ordinary word. It's not just some sort of trivia that you can lock away so you can pass a test. This word spoken and this word proclaimed and read and heard is Christ Jesus himself. It is the word made flesh. It is him in your ears pledging to you that his promise is sure and complete and it is yours forever. It is him on your foreheads watering you and wetting you and baptizing you, stamping his name upon you, bearing you into his death, raising you in his resurrection. And it is him on your tongue and him down your throat and him in your bellies and him at this altar. It is him as a foretaste of the feast to come, making you one with him, assuring you that all of the glories of heaven are yours. No mere remembrance or promise on our part. For what good is that in the face of the not yet that plagues us and terrifies me and causes me to doubt? No, this is Jesus himself. Real and present, forgiving, renewing, leading us in his way and in his truth. It is Jesus right here, right now, in the midst of the not yet that isn't good enough, declaring to you that the now of him for you is good enough. 
We may not think so. We still may doubt and worry and be afraid of the next day or the shame that covers us or the sin that hurts or the death that still looms. But none of that is of any concern. For none of that speaks to the reality of the situation. Our words can't fathom and they can't make real and they can't comfort. But God's word can. Sinful feelings, mournful death, scheming demons be damned. For Christ is not ashamed to call us brothers, fellow heirs of the inheritance of eternal life, to reign over all things. It is ours right now, maybe not yet fully. But what does that even matter? God's promise has more authority than my doubt. In the name of Jesus.